The first lesson, which will also serve as our sermon text for this morning, is taken from the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, the first 14 verses. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. O my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. This is the word of our God. The second lesson comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, the first 21 verses, which Luke describes, or in which Luke describes the, that first Pentecost 2,000 years ago. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to, sk to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of our God. Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Heavenly Father, through his Son, 
Jesus Christ and, and given to us in faith through the work of the Holy Spirit on this Pentecost Sunday. Our text for this morning is that Old Testament lesson. It's Ezekiel chapter 37, where God gives his Old Testament prophet in exile a, a, a vision that is a good picture. It's, it's a wonderful picture of, of what God does to people who are dead by nature. He brings them to life as we are today. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, I'm looking for confirmation students, recent confirmation students, Aiden, you're a confirmation student too, so <clears throat> don't point to your cousin. But you're still a student. What can a dead person do? Are you sure? That's right. Any confirmation student in the past 20 years could tell you it's not something that you need to be really smart to know, but a dead person can't do anything, right? When we come to the third article in the Apostles' Creed, <clears throat> we, we come to the knowledge of what the Holy Spirit does for us. And we take a look at the passages that tell us what dead people can do. Because by nature, what are we? Dead. The Bible tells us that we are blind, spiritually blind. We can't tell, we can't find God on our own. The Bible tells us that we are not only blind to God, but we are hostile towards God. That means we are enemies of God. The Bible also tells us that the things of God, like what we believe as central to our Christian faith, the cross of Jesus Christ crucified, that is utter nonsense, foolishness by nature. And, and then we sum it up with the, with the key passage from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Where Paul says the truth. He says, but as for you, you were dead in your trans transgressions and sins. And so then we ask the question, what can a dead person do? And we're not talking someone who is on life support. Because someone who is on life support can still perform some bodily functions. We're not talking about a person who is mostly dead. If there is such a thing, if you watch movies, sometimes they say this is a mostly dead person. We're talking about a dead person. A physically dead person cannot do anything for himself or herself to help him or her in any way. So also a spiritually dead person. And, and we talk about that in the third article because there is this belief out there that we can all make a decision for Jesus. That, that if we want to become a Christian, all we need to do is make that choice, that conscience, conscious choice to be one of Christ's followers. But that's discounting what the Bible tells us, that we are blind and that God is foolishness to us and anything about God is foolishness without the Holy Spirit and that we are dead in our transgressions and sins. And people who are dead cannot do anything for them spiritually as well, until the Holy Spirit gets involved. <clears throat> and, and today as we celebrate Pentecost, we celebrate the work of the Holy Spirit, kind of the forgotten member of the Trinity. We know what God the Father does, creation, look around you, preservation. We know what God the Son does, the whole cross, Good Friday. That's what Jesus did. He redeemed us from our sins. But what does the Holy Spirit do? What is his job? What is his function? The Holy Spirit we sometimes talk about as kind of that, that person behind the camera on a news set. You've got the anchor people who are giving you the news. You've also got all the people that are running behind the scenes. And the Holy Spirit is the one who is behind the scenes, but who is just as important in the whole show as anybody else, God the Father or God the Son himself. And that's what the Holy Spirit, that's what Pentecost is all about. Jesus says, go to Jerusalem and wait, because when you wait long enough, I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit who will bring you to life and give you the motivation to do what you are going to be doing for the rest of your lives. And, and we see a picture of the Holy Spirit's work in 
Ezekiel chapter 37. It's a picture that God paints for us. Where, where God brings Ezekiel into this valley of, of dry bones, it, it, it seems to be, if you look at verse 9 and verse 10, maybe kind of a res, the, the, the results of a bad battle, a battle gone bad. You've got hundreds, if not thousands, of bones there. They are the remnants of a vast army that was once alive, once fighting, but now something has gone wrong, and now you just have a bunch of bones. And it's not dead bones or dead bodies with life still on them or in them. It's not people that might, if you get some medical attention to them, come to life back again. These are bones. The, the, the prophet Ezekiel makes it very clear when he says, a valley of dry bones. These are bones that have been bones for a long, long time. What's the picture? What's the story that Ezekiel is trying to paint for us? What's the point of the vision? Where God was telling and talking to his children of Israel who were, for all intents and purposes, dead. Because it wasn't too many years before this that they had been carried off into exile. The Babylonians had come down. They had taken the people of Israel away, off into exile. They had destroyed their homes. They had destroyed their lands. They had removed them from their land. And now the people are sitting in exile, slaves, again, for all intents and purposes. And they're wondering, where is our hope? Are we ever going to get back to our homes? Will we ever, ever be able to get back to our land? Will we ever be able to rebuild our homes and everything that we worked so hard for back in Israel? In other words... They were hopeless, lifeless, dead. Notice how God describes themselves in verse 11. Our bones are dried up. They have no good in the present. Our hope is gone. Nothing good in the future because hope always talks about the future. And then, he, then they say, we are cut off. Everything that was good for them was now a distant memory in the past. And when God asked Ezekiel in verse 3, Son of man, can these bones live? What was Ezekiel's answer? He didn't agree with the Israelites. He didn't say, you know something? You are right. It is hopeless. We might as well just die here right now because there's no point in everything. No, he says, Sovereign Lord, only you know. And that's a good thing <clears throat> because he gave them a little bit of hope. You know, there are times in, in our lives as Christians when we are tempted to kind of answer the same way in our own lives or about our own lives. We might be asked the question, can these bones live? In other words, is there any hope in your life? But there are points in our life, in everybody's life, even Christians' lives, where you get to a point and you wonder, what is the point of everything? Is there any hope for me in my future? My bones are dead, in other words. My family is gone. My marriage is lost. I can't turn things around. My job has left me in the lurch. And I just spent a lot of money on a new house. It'll never work in my life. I'll never meet someone. I will always forever be lonely. I'll never get better. I can't believe everybody has left me. That's what the people of Israel were feeling. That there wasn't any hope in their life. That they thought, why bother with life at all? H have you ever been to that point in your life when you've said or thought or considered any of those things? Again, did you notice how Ezekiel answered God's question, can these bones live? There is hope in his answer. Lord, you know if they can live or if they cannot live. In other words, he didn't say no. Why? Because with God, nothing is impossible. God has power that you cannot imagine. God has more power that you cannot find in doctors or nurses or health systems. God has more power that you can't find in therapists or counselors. God has that kind of power that this world does not even know. And, and note where Ezekiel found the power. When he was standing there in that valley of dry bones, 
What did the Lord say to him? He said, prophesy to the bones, son of man. And we think, what in the world is this? You might think, well, it's just a dream. Prophesy to the bones? Prophesy to a bunch of dead bones scattered around in that dry valley? That's what God says. In other words, speak to them. Speak God's word. Because what does a prophet do? He prophesies. But what does it to mean to prophesy? To speak God's word. So Ezekiel was supposed to speak God's words to those dry bones. And then what happened? There was a rattling sound. And Ezekiel looked a little bit closer, and the bones started to come together, and they started to form skeletons again. Before they were just in disarray. Now they actually looked like people again, or at least a skeleton. And then tendons started to form on the bones, connecting bone to bone. And then flesh and skin, and all of a sudden you've got bodies there. Not just dry bones anymore. But there was one problem still. Even though they had tendons and flesh and skin and they kind of looked like bodies now, there was no breath. There was no life to them. And, and where did that breath come from? It came from God. Just like it did back in the Garden of Eden when God formed Adam out of the dust of the earth and then did what to give him life? It says he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Not too long ago, the ascension, we talked about Jesus gathering his disciples there on the Mount of Olives. And just before he ascended into heaven, he says to them, you know, I want you to go into Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. And then on Pentecost, what happened? The sound of the rushing wind, it was when the Holy Spirit gave breath to his people. So that those disciples from then on would spend the rest of their lives going to every nation and every people and every tribe under the whole world with the message of Christ crucified and life for all. Because there was breath in there again. I'm not going to ask you to do this. Some of you might be tempted, but don't. If you were to hold your breath for, say, 60 seconds or 90 seconds, if you're really, really good, and then I would ask you now, talk to your neighbor while you are still holding your breath. Could you do it? I'm not going to ask you to try it again. Could you do that? It's impossible, right? You can't talk unless there's breath. If you want to try it, do it after church sometime with somebody around but you can't talk. You can't even say hi without giving some breath. If you're holding your breath, if you have no breath whatsoever, it is impossible to do anything, to talk whatsoever. And that's why it's so hard to have asthma or emphysema. Or, or if you're trying to climb a mountain out in Colorado where you're 14,000 feet in the sky and you're just putting two feet ahead of you and then you got to stop because you literally cannot grab your breath. Because there is so little oxygen in the air. I, I feel sorry for people who can't grab their breath or catch their breath at all. Climbing a set of stairs, climbing the ramp here in church knocks them flat. Sometimes you carry a, a little bottle of oxygen or you, you wheel some oxygen tank behind you because they need the breath when they need the breath. What, what was the command again that God gave Ezekiel in order to make those dry bones live? prophesy to the bones he said and what happened they got the breath they got the holy spirit in them the same thing that happens when we speak god's word to our children whether it's sunday school or catechism class or parents doing their job as parents and grandparents doing their job as grandparents and speaking god's word to them teaching them what god has to say in his word. The same thing that happens when we do any kind of Christian education and teach children and adults what God has to say for us in his word. The same thing that happens when we start to believe that there is no hope in my life whatsoever because I am at a point where God cannot even help me. What happens when we speak the word of God to people like that? Good things only happen. The word tells us about Jesus who is willing to give up his breath on the cross and expire on Good Friday so that we might have hope and 
that we might have life. What, what can dead people do? You don't need to be a genius or a con for man to know the answer to that question. They can do absolutely nothing. Even spiritually dead persons cannot do anything. But Pentecost reminds us that God sent his Holy Spirit to breathe life into his church. Sometimes what seems to be a dead, lifeless church that doesn't have a whole lot of motivation or a whole lot of energy, but God sent the Holy Spirit into his church to give us that motivation into our lifeless bodies. And so not only do we have hope for the future, but we have eternal life in our future. Amen. The peace of God which goes beyond our understanding will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.